In case you just joined, I'll just start by introducing myself and why we're here today. Um, my name is Emma and uh, I'm a software engineer at Spotify. I've been working on Backstage for the last five years on the many different parts. And uh, yeah, as we have heard in some of the talks today, there are a lot of Backstage plugins and there is, Backstage is very flexible so you can extend it based on your needs. But where do you actually start? So yeah, today I have this amazing group of panelists with me uh, that will give you a little bit of a deep dive into those topics. Um, so with that, I will sit down and let you introduce yourself. So why don't you start with, yeah, just your name, your role, uh, the company you work for, and maybe why you started Use Backstage. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Levi. I'm, I'm from Zalando. I'm a head of developer experience of Builder Productivity. Um, Zalando is the biggest fashion e-commerce in Europe with more than 50 million active customers. Uh, we have more than 2,000 engineers and six engineering hubs across Europe and more than 4.5 thousand applications of microservices across the company. And that's one of the reasons why we started going for Backstage. Um, and using uh, using the platform. Um, my name is Dan Laird. I'm an engineering manager with Ovo Energy. So in the UK, we supply about five billion people with electricity. Uh, we don't have anywhere near the scale that Levy just explained. Uh, we're about 400 tech people, uh, 10,000 employees in the company. Um, we started using Backstage when I joined the company a couple of years ago and primarily to try and give information to the engineering community because in a remote first company you can't rely on the coffee conversations in person anymore so you have to give a portal for people to actually understand what's going on, where it's going on and who you should talk to. Hi, my name is Bogdan. I'm working on the company Ball. It's the biggest e-commerce company in the Netherlands and the Belgium. We have about maybe like 10 or 12 million uh, customers. We are using also like more than 1,000 microservices uh, uh, like in, in the company in such kind of the scale. Um, I'm like an, I'm like lead, lead engineer in my uh, in my team, and also I'm recently from the end of the last year became um, main, maintainer of the scaffolder, and I was also uh, really enjoyed to see one of the topics which was today in the morning presented by Helen regarding the scaffolder retrying stuff. So that's what I'm like really actively working on. Uh, on the backstage, we started working on that like four years ago. And I was even like checked on adopters uh, when we were there, and we were like second company. We should started like adopting the backstage. Our primary goal was to have the backstage for the engineers, so they like when they start in the morning, like they are drinking the coffee and they're looking at the monitor. They can see what they should to do today. This is our primary goal. What we're still going on forward to date. Uh, we are still like on our journey, but it's like primary goal to make engineers happy, so they know what they have to achieve. Uh, so far, we see like the most of the traffic comes very interesting from the from the from the search. Uh, you're like building one thing, but you see like when customers how they are using that stuff, engineers they using completely different. So we're investing much more time how we can make our customer customers more interested in other areas. Like for example, we invested a lot in the scaffolder, uh, but it's not the thing what you use every day. So we understand, but it's really minimize the how many load for the engineers you have, how many checkpoints engineers have to deal with, and it's like a big investment which you can see like in the long term. Hi everybody, my name is Alex and I work as uh, the head of platform engineering at a fashion brand called H&M. And the reason why we started using Backstage is because we needed a front end for our platform engineering ecosystem. Thank you so much. And earlier today, uh, Helen did a little survey in here in person where she asked like, okay, which stage are you in your uh, adoption journey? And we definitely have people here who've just started to check out Backstage or doing a profile concept and or have fully adopted it. Um, so I'm interested to know, and maybe Levy, if you can start, like I know you are using two different strategies to actually go from having a proof of concept of backstage uh, to roll it out and uh, get more users to use it. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the way that we look at it is that uh, we try to 
uh, tackle two customers, basically one being the users of our instance of Backstage, which is called Sunrise internally, and the second one is actually basically the people that would contribute to the platform. Because we, know, we knew back then, uh, around three or four years ago, we were just two, uh, three people in the team uh, that was working on this, and we knew that we wouldn't be able to achieve everything by ourselves. So we really tried to uh, do it in a way that would be very very easy for people to actually contribute and start contributing to the platform. So taking away things like, for example, authentication, or taking away things like, for example, the local development environment or the CI/CD pipeline, how do you actually deploy you know, and update the changes or receive the changes and so on. Um, and we started uh, on, the, on the first customer, uh, meaning the people that would use uh, Sunrise or, or Backstage back then, by looking into what were the things that actually people needed and what would, would the, be the value that we could bring to them. Um, and there was uh, back then a big problem around like how do we discover information, how do we get access to every resource that we have, and we look also at how fragmented the whole user journey for, for software engineers were, and we really tried to to uh, step by step increase the coverage of the tools that we had in the company uh, to actually have it integrated in our platform. So when we started our first MVP, uh, was very simple with search, with catalog, uh, with tech documentation, around from the 2,000 engineers that we had, uh, we had back then, and we still have around 400 of them started already using it daily um, when we release. And today we have around 60% of the whole uh, software engineering family actually using our platform every day, um, more than 85% using it weekly. It goes beyond the software engineering um, job families for, you know, for a monthly basis where more than 2.5 thousand is using it actively um, in, in a month, uh, 2.5 thousand engineers. Um, so our, we focused quite a lot on our homepage and how we actually presented the, the actual actionable information, as, uh, as my friend here said, um, and we invested quite a lot on that as well. So, and on the integration side of things, we actually got uh, 36 uh, plugins that were contributed internally, um, created either by the core team or by contribution for more than 120 individuals across the company. Got it, cool. And Bogdan, you had a little bit of a different strategy, and I won't spoil too much, I'll let you talk about it more, but can you tell me a little bit more about how you were rolling backstage out to your users? Yeah, our strategy was a little bit different. Before we have kind of like an internal, different internal portal. It was kind of like a catalog, but with only the data what you have kind of like microservices and who owns those microservices. Uh, what we did, we replaced it completely with the backstage. It took some of the time for us to have all the features there, and we also like adding more features, more sources from different things there. Like for example, you can think about like LDAP, or you have like something of HRI, you have SRE, and other things which are contributed together. So you have your catalog which is way more there. Plus you can also now to search really quickly there. That's why like our customers, like our engineers really like our search because you can search documentation, you can search the Confluence, you can search catalog from different sources. And that's the biggest power going there because whenever the more sources you supply to your system, the more people like it because they can find uh, what they're exactly looking for. And that was a really nice experience from the user point of view. Uh, we had some kind of experience, okay, now if I didn't find anything in the backstage, then it really doesn't exist. And we also had some of the experience, like adoption, for example. We have kind of like user interviews. We have in our company UX designers. They are coming to, to, the, to the users and they're asking, how do you use it? Can we, for example, go with you and have some feature and test it with you? Oh, I don't want it. like yet another system. Maybe like not with me, maybe some, with someone else. But after they're looking at it, how that works, they really love it. And afterwards, they like said to us, yeah, it was really so great. I would like to tell about that system. To, to my team as well. Because when you're telling something to the people, okay, we have another platform, and they're thinking, oh, yet another one. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Alex, uh, from a platform engineering concept lens, I guess, what was your strategies? 
Yeah, so essentially what we do is that we, again, really try to use Backstage as a front end for platform engineering. So when we're rolling out Backstage, actually what we're doing is rolling out the platform engineering concept right, to different teams. And as a natural part of that, Backstage is part of that package. Um, essentially. So we look at the platform engineering end-to-end -end journey, and then we see what we can actually surface in, in backstage. So we focused a lot on scaffolding, and then surfacing engineering metrics, and then uh, compliance to guardrails has been our strategy. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're not trying to push backstage. We're pushing platform engineering, and backstage is just the front end of that ecosystem. Got it. We'll uh, uh, go more into details of plugins soon, but I'm curious. So these platform teams also like does uh, these teams own the plugins then that you bring into backstage as well? Is that how you're organized? Yeah. So what we essentially do is we in platform engineering dictate the end-to-end -end experience that we want to see, and then we have different teams collaborating with us to essentially contribute with with uh, what they want to surface uh, from their standpoint. Cool. And Dan, do you want to add anything around from Alvo Energy, around your strategies for rolling out backstage? Uh, well, I, th I think being honest, our strategy uh, is a tale of two halves, really. Um, the first part was you want to get excitement about using backstage. And so you're sort of trying to promote it internally. But we fell into a trap, being like honest with you, you know, all of you guys, which was sort of a bit of a sugar hit. Uh, we kept adding new plugins. Wow, look at this. This is brilliant. And some people go, oh, that's good. But you can only add so many plugins and keep the sugar going before you hit like the, the sugar crash, which is, and so what? Like, what are you building? So we're now sort of on the bottom of the crash, if you like, where we sort of, we've introduced all these plugins, got everyone really excited, and the so what bit, we're sort of heading much more in the direction that Alex has talked about, which is uh, we've got tools out there that we want people to use in a certain way. And now we're starting to build a, a sort of more coherent user story rather than just a sort of fireworks display of new plugins every couple of weeks, which builds and promotes internally in the company, which is a, you know, it's a key part of any journey. But now there's a, a so what question, and now we're answering that one. Cool. OK, perfect. You've already started to talk about plugins. So let's dive a little bit deeper into it. So there's a lot of great open source plugins out there. And I feel like most of us start with, OK, we have this set of problems within our organizations. And how do we actually go to find the plugin, plugins that can help us solve these? So can you talk a little bit more about which, how you were like identifying these plugins that can help you solve your problems at Alvo Energy? Yeah, so there again, going back to the sort of the sugar crash and the sugar sort of hit analogy, uh, we went for some plugins. There were there were two parts. Uh, the plugins that looked impressive, not necessarily the most useful for the engineers, but they sort of created excitement around what we were trying to do. So we just essentially go to the like the backstage portal and go, oh yeah, that looks quite good. Let's try out the Kubernetes plugin because we have some users with Kubernetes. Um, but in reality the plugins that were actually proving more useful were where they were more focused on specific issues. And we were trying to sort of answer a question within our company around ownership, um, but not necessarily just ownership of microservices, but also ownership of knowledge. And that led us very early into a, an early conversation with Spotify themselves around uh, skills exchange. Because when you've got a distributed workforce, Trying to identify who's got what skills and how to sort of find that knowledge is, is really hard. Um, now, again, as with all adoption journeys, like the idea is sound, the tool is perfect, the plugin has definitely got promise, but we're still at that stage where we're trying to get enough critical mass, you know, push that snowball down the hill. Because until you've got 20% of your team declaring their skills, essentially no one's declaring their skills. But if, as we add more people into to skills exchange, that sort of creates uh, that uh, excitement factor because it's something that isn't answered in any of the other tools that are at the company. Um, but yeah, the, in, in the whole, there's a plugin for everything in Backstage. And yeah. the best thing, just try them and, and see if they work. But just beware the sugar crash if you get people excited and then you have to maintain it afterwards. <laughs> Love it. And Alex, you were talking to me before about like that you at H&M uh, defined what's good in text before uh, in terms of software, of course. What, what are you doing now instead? Yeah, so what we tried to do at the beginning at, at H&M is essentially try to explain to our engineers what good looks like, essentially. And the way that we did that was uh, basically in text. 
uh, right? And we realized quite quickly that you know uh, everybody has different understandings of what's actually written in text. Um, so what we actually did was starting to work with uh, Soundcheck to actually start being much more concrete about what we mean. Uh, with, for example, you know, uh, have performance tests being ran before uh, launching something to production? Are you running vulnerability scans? Uh, those kinds of, uh, uh, of things. That really allows us to both be clear to our users, it's a better uh, user experience, and we can also track it at the organizational level uh, and actually help out teams when we identify that they're lagging behind in some areas, we can actually talk to them and, and actually show them the metrics of this is where you could be better. Uh, it's also been great being able to service these metrics to, uh, you know, engineering leads and management saying that, you know, we are making a difference in terms of being uh, better at uh, building software. Cool. Levi, Bogdan, do you want to add anything in terms of how you are identifying plugins? You have touched both on, like, discoverability, homepage, anything to, anything to add there? Yeah, I think, like, with the like, identifying plugins, it is about also, like, I think it's more than that, right? It's like identifying problems that are worth solving and where I actually in the user journey are people losing time, where they're actually um, having suboptimal experiences or you know, struggling with feedback loops. Um, so I, I try to look more from that perspective of where actually people is, um, having suboptimal experiences, what kind of problems are they having, um, and then working backwards from that, and then identifying which kind of plugins, maybe on the plugins, uh, on the plugins page, or even general GitHub search on what kind of solutions are there to actually uh, help people in the end. And I think that has proven like quite valuable for our engineers, because then um, there is a, if, People know that the product is gonna, gonna gonna solve a problem. They're gonna come back to it, and you won't struggle as much with adoption uh, if they really see the value on this. Yeah, from our experience, usually like what we did like initially, we went through all the plugins, and we immediately like eliminated what kind of plugins we are interested in, and then in that s set of the plugins, we started like evaluate of them like how much effort would require from us to start using them. If that effort is too high, maybe it's not the place to start working and using those plugins. Maybe we can build our own. Because in our team, we have not only engineers, we have only UX designers, we have also data analysts. So we're looking at all perspectives, how the plugin will work. If everyone is uh, happy about that, and uh, we can find the ground, it will be like holistic approach. Because of the most uh, like uh, plugins, they not, don't look holistic. And then for us, it's like a biggest problem, at least in our company. And we need to invest time to make it holistic. And uh, if you see that solution not really for us, maybe it's better to build it uh, for our own. And it's not only about us. We all the time go into the users. We're asking users, how do you find it? Is it like easy to use? Is it not? What was uh, for you the biggest struggle? And only after that, when we have all the discovery with UX designers, with all the uh, like, with some set of the users, with some set of engineers, and when we have some data that it really will solve the problem, then only we'll start building it, start like uh, including that plugin. Not right away, okay, it's nice, it looks cool, it's so nice, she grabs there, let's like enable it and see how it goes. Now we are going a little bit differently. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll open up for some questions from the audience. Anyone have any questions? I'll run around with the microphone. Oh, let's start here. Hey, thanks for your insight. I had a question. So you mentioned uh, infrastructure. I was wondering why there isn't more, let's say, data infrastructure plugins or things like that that are available with Backstage. Do any of you see your teams managing their data infrastructure through Backstage, or is that just not a great use case? Thanks. I think I can take that one. Um, yes, we do have seen users wanting to have data data integrations. Uh, we do in Zalando have the whole machine learning platform or an orchestration running, uh, the visualization part of it um, also in, in our backstage instance. Yes, it's, it's, it is a problem that um, we are also tackling and solving with backstage as well. If I'm, uh, we're the same as well, actually. We've um, just because we're trying to use Backstage as a 
portal that declares ownership. So although the data teams have got their own specific tools, like Data Hub, which is uh, around Acryl, and, and there's some other tools out there, um, and we've got Kafka infrastructure and all these things, what we've done is just use things like Google APIs to give us a list of all the big query data sets we have, and we just attribute those as being owned by teams. And even at the simplest level, that gives you something valuable for those guys. There's loads more that could be done, but there's already tools deployed at the company, so then you feel like you're moving deck chairs, whereas the ownership piece was something that was, wasn't necessarily solved, so we added that. Yeah, in the account company, we're also doing kind of the same, but now we're doing only the like first day of the experience, whenever you create the whole like infrastructure, the application and deployment part to the user. So you just need to only like to supply what kind of the name of the application would be, and we will completely like spin up for you the everything what is required there. Our like goal as well to, to do much more granular, for example, you want to add database, or you would like to add something else. But it's a little bit on the future, because we are building some like infrastructure heavy things. And only after that, we will start building like backstage on top. So it's also like in our plans. Awesome. Thank you. Um, how are you doing with time? OK, cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the very insightful panel discussion. So. I wanted to know a little bit more from uh, all of you on the day zero. Before you started using Backstage, I guess you had all had your own IDP, uh, where you, you had your users already using some platform, more or less abstracted or more or less exposed, I think, on infrastructure level. So I wanted to know how you went through your initial IDP, and then uh, understanding how do we want to use Backstage, why do we want to use Backstage, and how it would integrate with sometimes the in-house like abstractions that you beat for already your, your own developer platform. So could you explain more on how you went through that stage to ending up with uh, having Backstage for your users? Yeah, I, I can start. Uh, I mean, before we were using Backstage, essentially the entire developer experience was CLI-based. Um, and then we noticed this, our users were not really happy with it. And we also spent a lot of time on you know, making it compatible with different operating systems and that kind of stuff. And then we had this brilliant idea of, oh, let's just build a front end. And then as we started building, we were like, OK, I think someone has solved this problem before. Uh, so then we actually started looking at the market. We did a bunch of POCs with you know, vendors and looking at different open source solutions. And that's how we basically ended up with, with Backstage. It's all based on a user need. And the user need was, the, you know, in our particular case, the instantiation of new uh, software uh, services were, it was just too clunky, essentially. Yeah, in our experience, uh, it was started like four years ago before I joined. But what I heard there, there was like kind of like, um, like few, you can imagine we have like 50 different systems, and you even don't know where you need to go to. And there was like very enthusiastic developer in our company, and he was just pitch his idea to managers, and they were so happy, happy about it. There was like a really like a dream. Yes, let's do it. And that was just kind of like a beginning, like to do some kind of a little bit playing around with that. And yeah, that was our journey. Yeah, so uh, for us, it was not really like one IDP itself. It was a combination of different things uh, from, you know, application registry to documentation sites, publishing mechanisms or, or things like that. And um, the way that we did it was basically when we were looking into solving the problem of like how do we reduce that fragmentation that I was talking about, we had more than a hundred and something different kinds of uh, portals or places where people could find information. How can we create one unified thing and how can we actually do it in a way that others can contribute because with a small team we were not going to be able to do everything by ourselves. Um, and then we started looking at this, and this was about the same time where Backstage was released on the open source as a beta software. And that's where we actually, you know, look at it and say, okay, we are trying to achieve the same thing. Um, let's try it out. Let's do a, a, a hack week, two weeks, see what we can do. And, you know, in two weeks, we basically got like five different things integrated, and we were like, okay, you know, I think this is the right thing for us to try out. And even though it's early stages, it might take some time to get on stability level or maturity level that we, we want to have. But let's contribute to that as well. Um, and I think that, that was our journey. Yay to hack weeks. <laughs> 
Hi, I wanted to follow up on these questions of how to treat your um, fellow platform teams also as a, as a user. And uh, for example, Levy, you mentioned that you had 39 plugins being contributed from like other platform teams. What were like your learnings in terms of what worked really well and what didn't work in terms of enabling contributions from other teams to the backstage portal? Yeah, so what what didn't work well, I think it's like trying to just have it organically or just pointing people to documentation. Um, we had like very good documentation and onboarding material for, pe for people to start and that doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily work well. Uh, I think what works well, it's really about saying, you know what, let me spend some time with you. Let me show you how it works. Let me uh, show you our vision. Let me show you what we want to achieve and see what parts of the product as well make sense to have it in the portal, which parts does not make sense. It's better off, you know, the, the source of the, of the truth and not in the in the visualization layer so having those kind of like really hands-on discussions with like engineers talking with engineers and really showing uh, showing how it works, how to create a new plugin, having those demo sessions, I think that's what, what really worked for us, uh, especially when it comes to people that are not so experienced with JavaScript, with TypeScript or front-end technologies in general. I think that that was our journey. Did you want to add something to that, Dan? I was just going to uh, say, from our point of view, we actually haven't made it work yet. And I'm just, again, it's like the point of these panels is to be honest about the story. Um, we haven't managed. We Backstage was deployed by us as a developer experience team. And therefore, the other parts that might contribute plugins were always another part of the organization, which means that there's always sort of communication structures that make it very hard to make these things work. Uh, I'm hoping that's going to change now because I've just changed roles. I've now got the data engineering team and the production engineering teams all with developer experience. So now we're going to essentially take the same approach that Levy talks about, you know, sit with people, say, how can we help you solve a problem, recognizing that there's a steep learning curve if you look at a backstage plugin and say, why don't you have a go? Uh, it, it's a bit harder than people would like to start with. So we're going to have to handhold through that journey. Yeah, there's also the fear, right? Like there's also this immediate fear of like, this unknown thing called backstage. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so before we wrap up today, um, I know there are people here, or I think there are people here who will be like, I'm going to start to use backstage tomorrow. So if you have the chance to give them one advice uh, in their adoption journey, what would, you, what would that be? And maybe start with you, Alex. My biggest tip is, I mean, focus on the user and the user needs. I mean, like any product that you're developing, right? If it brings value to the users, then people will onboard to it and use it. Yeah, I think the same how much like value backstage uh, will add to your company. But also from our point of view, for example, we really would like to have contributors. And what we see in our company that whenever you don't have like TypeScript uh, based company, it's really hard to find people who will contribute. And this is like a main driver whenever like people stop and thinking, okay, yeah, it's TypeScript. I don't know. It's like a big ecosystem. So you need like to invest your time. You need to like to teach people and they need to be enthusiastic. Some people even like whenever they hear it's TypeScript. No, no, no. I'm not going to do that. That's you need also to consider it. I'm going to be a bit cheeky. I'm going to add two things. The, the first is it doesn't have to be TypeScript. So for our engineers, we've written plugins in Go, and it just outputs JSON files. And then backstage dealing with JSON is really easy, but it opens up a whole other part of your organization to contribute rather than going, I don't know, TypeScript. And the second well, quick point is don't start with a catalog. Uh, we tried to start with the catalog. and. It involves so many stakeholders from the wider business that it feels like you're sort of wading through organizational and people problems rather than solving engineering challenges. Whereas if you take the approach like Alex has talked about, you've got a real problem that's solvable in a finite amount of time. So start there. Yeah, I, I think like it's very similar to, to yours. I would say like pick one use case that is the most impact, impactful one for your organization and tackle that. An example. You know, uh, there was an incident a few months ago. Somebody said, it took me like two hours to find what was the change that happened in production. 
So we say, okay, why why was that? Where were missing information? So then we create a plugin for saying, okay, the latest deployment so that this doesn't happen again. So it's just one example, right? Like, but it's really about like not trying to solve all the problems at once. Uh, but really picking one, the most impactful problem and say, okay, how can I solve this problem? How does Backstage contribute uh, to solving the problem? And then from there, really, um, yeah, it will open up the doors because then you have impact, you have trust also from the stakeholders around you, you had the trust from your team as well that they created value uh, and then move from there. Uh, Did you want to add something more? Yeah, just something that sprung to my mind. I think, yeah, solving problems, but just a, a caveat on that. Also, not solving like individual problems in isolation. I really like to think of it as like let's look at the end-to-end -end experience, right? Because if you just solve particular problems, but the distributed problems, then there's no real, there's small added value. You don't get the wow effect to come back to backstage all the time. Awesome. Thank you so much for participating in this panel today. And thank you for listening and g having great questions. And uh, yeah, I have a really important thing as part of my speaker notes. And that's to show the QR code that you can use to give feedback on this panel. So scan this one. And thank you so much. And yeah, give them a round of applause, everyone.